I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker this evening, Reverend Dr. Oral Aldridge Walwyn Thomas. Reverend Dr. Thomas is the 10th president of the United Theological College of the West Indies. He hails to us from Bethesda Village in Antigua, West Indies. A strong West Indian woman, his mother, Mary Millet, ensured he attended Bethesda Methodist Church weekly. His spiritual formation and theological outlook grew from his humble beginnings. Reverend Dr. Thomas obediently responded to the call of God to serve his church in the Caribbean as a Methodist minister. He attended University Theological College of the West Indies from 1984 to 1987, where he earned his diploma in ministerial studies and Bachelor of Arts in Theology. While studying, he realized his lifelong dream of becoming a recognized batsman and captain of the university cricket team. In continued faithfulness, and a desire for further preparation, he earned his master's degree in theological studies from Eden Theology Seminary in the United States and his philosophy of doctorate degree and postgraduate teaching certificate from Birmingham University in the United Kingdom. Reverend Dr. Thomas is a well-known biblical author and lecturer. He has taught several courses at the college. Reverend Dr. Thomas is married to Zola and they have two children, Joel and Crystal. We have a powerhouse speaker presenting tonight. He'll be presenting Mission by the Roof. We are in store for a thought provoking Caribbean perspective to accomplishing the mission with much zeal and success. Brothers and sisters, the reading for today's mission seminar is Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. At the end of the Gospel reading, the next voice you will hear is that of Reverend Dr. Oral Aldridge Walwyn Thomas. Jesus heals a paralytic. When he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. The word of the Lord. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Thomas. Thank you so very much, uh, Sister Howell, uh, in particular for your kind words of uh, introduction. Uh, let me say, first of all, that I owe this privilege to the Reverend Dr. Cuthbert Edwards, the superintendent minister of the St. Christ Circuit, as we know. And I'm pleased to acknowledge his wife, uh, Ashley, and to greet all my fellow Methodists on this call um, this evening. All praise to our redeeming Lord, who joins us by his grace. I'm pleased to this afternoon that this opportunity uh, presents uh, me, and I'm sure um, Dr. Edwards as well, because it, I'm joining forces um, with him uh, in this missionary endeavor uh, this evening, albeit uh, through this uh, medium. We have been 
joining forces uh, in missions, you might be pleased to know, uh, since the mid-1970s, that is some 46 years ago. And I'm sure that as we approach 50 years of joining forces in mission, uh, in particular with um, Ulrich or Pops, as we call him in Antigua and, and Watson and George, uh, from those days in the late 1970s, uh, we are still joining forces uh, uh, in missions, um, responding to the, the grace of God and the call of God uh, on our lives uh, through, through Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that um, a 50-year analysis uh, of those endeavors will make for some enlightening analysis, and I'm sure it will be of benefit uh, to the church as we um, examine and analyze what we have been doing as local preachers and as, as pastors uh, in Caribbean Methodism for the past nine, 50 years. So I, I'm really pleased to be joining um, forces um, with him this afternoon uh, in this, uh, in this um, endeavor. And so I uh, greet you all and look at this as a very uh, special privilege uh, to be um, sharing. I'm going to share screen at this time. I hope that is, that is good. And then I do that. Okay, as you have, as you have heard, I have uh, styled, if you may, uh, this presentation on missions on um, the theme, Missions by the Roof. Uh, that perspective is had from Mark chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 1 to 5, as you have, you have heard. Now, when we speak of When we speak of through the roof, that is a phrase that we are quite familiar with. Uh, and we know that it has to do with fantastic results. Uh, that which has gone beyond expectation, uh, that which is highly successful. So we would say that um, the sale, we would say that the, the, the sale of whatever, um, it may be has, has gone through the roof. Uh, our expectations have gone through the roof. Um, it has gone through the roof. So when, when, when we speak of that phrase, we, we, it is that which has gone beyond expectation and it is that which is highly successful and that which is fantastic in terms of results. Now, when we look at the, the passage that we have read, we what we what we what we will notice there is that these persons who brought this paralyzed um, um, person to, to, to be healed by Jesus, they went by the roof. By the roof. In other words, they used unconventional means to get this person in need. To Jesus. And so uh, when we think of by the roof, we're talking about those unconventional means. We're talking about the taking of risk in order to overcome an obstacle. Uh, so um, clearly they had fantastic results. They did with that which went beyond expectation, we, we might say. And what they wanted, they got, which was the healing of this person. But they went by the roof. They did not, they did not, they did not, it, it was not about um, success. It was not about expectation. It's about their desperation. And they went by the roof. So we I want to use that then as our lens uh, by which to, to view and to understand what we're talking about when we talk about missions by the roof. Right. 
So I want then for us to have a, a brief look at this this biblical biblical text. When we when we look at this biblical text, what we are seeing is that the text is not addressing the success Jesus is having in his ministry in Capernaum. Um, Mark, as we are aware, um, written in the context in which uh, Mark was written in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem and the, um, the, 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 the Roman Jewish war, would have placed the, 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 the disciples in very difficult circumstances. So if, if, we, if we are aware that when we read Mark, Mark is dealing with the difficulties and the challenges um, of following Jesus. Uh, because you know, the, the context in which um, it was written um, was, was, was one in which it was very challenging uh, to, um, to follow Jesus. So it is about what does it really mean to be a disciple? So clearly, um, the, 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 the text here uh, within that context is not adjusting the success because uh, it is more the challenges that Jesus is having in his ministry in um, Capernaum. Now, with such large crowd, we might be tempted to think or to conclude that Jesus's ministry has gone through the roof, that there is fantastic results. There is, um, that, 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 that Jesus here, um, was, his ministry was very successful. And so we, 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 we could be carried away with the thought of, through the roof because of the, the large crowds and what was happening to Jesus there in Capernaum. But as we see here, uh, or can see, is that the text is speaking of a challenge that was overcome. The text is speaking of a risk that was taken. And the text is speaking of an obstacle that was removed in order to get the paralyzed man to Jesus. So rather than success, the text is speaking of perseverance, perseverance. So we could say that rather than through the roof, the text is speaking of by the roof. All right, so don't let, us, don't let us lose the plot here. Through the roof has to do with fantastic results, going beyond expectation, being highly successful. But what we are seeing here is but an unconventional means to get someone who was desperately in need and persons who, were, who, who, who had desperate needs to get them the help that the person needed, the help that they wanted. And they took risks and they had to overcome um, obstacles in order to get, um, to get the help they wanted. So I am contending that this, this, this text is more about by the roof in terms of our missions um, rather than through, uh, through the roof. Now, from this biblical text, there is a, a message, a thesis with which we are going to work um, this evening that we talk about um, missions. And that thesis, that, that message I would want to share this evening is this that to bring others to Jesus may yet demand or require going by the roof. To bring others to Jesus may yet demand or require going by the roof. Now, to want otherwise, that is, um, you know, want you know, fantastic results and success and so on, to want otherwise, is to desire glory without a cross. It is to desire glory without a cross. And it is wanting to reap without sowing. 
it is wanting gain without pain, and it is wanting to win wars without fighting battles. Huh? Because that is what it is going to take to go by the roof. Uh, is, that is what it is going to take to bring others to Jesus by the roof. I want to make a distinction here, which I think is uh, important. And that has to do with mission and missions. We speak a lot about the mission of the church. And I would want to contend that what we ought to be speaking about is not so much about the mission of the church, but the, the, the missions of the church. Because, you see, mission is what God does and what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. Hmm? Mission is, is, is what God has done for us. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Huh? Uh, you know, redeeming, calling humanity. Now, that is mission. And what happens then is that when we talk about missions, uh, mission is what God does. Missions is our response to what God does. Missions has to do with the church's action as agents of God's mission, taking part in the liberating action of God in Christ to bring about change in people's lives, in structures, and systems. So missions is what the church does in response to God's act of love in Jesus Christ. So what we are to be talking about, it is the, the missions of the church. Some of you might already, already know that the church does not have a mission. It is the mission of God that has a church. Huh? It is the mission of God that has a church. The mission of God that has uh, a church. So we, we, we want to make that little distinction um, that mission is what God is what God does, and missions is um, is our response to God's act of love in in Jesus Christ. I wonder if I can make a little detour here, and uh, I'm talking to my fellow my fellow Methodists, so I, I can speak, I believe, provocatively. Um, it is not on the slide, but it is coming to me that possibly I should um, expand on this a little bit and see what my fellow Methodists um, think a little later. You know, I want to contend, I want to put it to you that we call, you know, um, the church to which we belong, the Methodist church, we call it the Methodist church, in the Caribbean and the Americas. The Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas. You know what I've been contending for some time now? I've been contending that I think we need to rethink that name. And we want, and I'm going to make the argument briefly for it, and we can discuss it later if we if we care to. Um, that the rethink then would be the Caribbean and the America's Methodist Church. So we have the MCCA, and I'm thinking that what we should have is the CAMC, C-A-M, Caribbean and the America's Methodist Church. I'll tell you why I say that. I was privileged, blessed, um, to have the opportunity to study in, um, in England. And when I went to um, England, I went to uh, the Celio Methodist Church. I don't know if Reverend Watty is online, but um, he did work there um, along with um, Dr. George Mulrain and Bruce Swap and others. And so it is the Selyok Methodist Church. And when I went there to worship, Matthew, I'm coming from Bethesda, I'm coming from Antigua, I'm coming from the Caribbean. And it was the same hymn book. <laughs> it was the same set of prayers. It was the same liturgy. And it was as if I was still in the Caribbean. So I said, but I don't understand. I'm in a place that has four seasons and I'm coming from a place that has one season, the hurricane season. And the, 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 the worship of God 
is undifferentiated. There's, there's absolutely no difference. And I said, and, and from then it has got me thinking that, because when we talk about the Methodist church in the Caribbean and the Americas, I ask myself, which Methodist church? And it seems to me that is the British Methodist church. Yeah, they brought it over. We haven't really taken the time to, to shape it into our, our image and likeness. In other words, it is, the, it is the church that is the Methodist church that is describing the context and not the context that is describing the church. And I said, but if the church is going to look like us, uh, if the church is going to look like us, if the church is going to really belong to us, then how we sing, how we worship, how we dress, how we approach God, the liturgy must look like us. In, in, in not supposed to be looking like what they have in England. It's, it's supposed to be looking like us in the Caribbean. So, you know, I, 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 I wonder when we think about missions and we think about mission and we think about our church and, and you know, it is for us to think about because the Methodist church in the Caribbean and the Americas, we need to ask ourselves, which Methodist church? And when we ask ourselves that question, I'm sure the answer is going to be the one that they have in Britain. Huh? That is the one they brought out, out here. Um, yes, we can, we can shape and form our Methodist beliefs into our image and likeness, into our liturgy and who we are as a people in the Caribbean. But we have not stopped to do that. Huh? We have not stopped to do that in our response. We just talk about the mission of the church. It is, it is the mission of God that has a church. And if, if we go by that tenet, if we go by that belief, if we go by that principle, then we are going to begin to shape a church in our image and likeness. So instead of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, I think that we should really have the Caribbean and the Americas Methodist Church. That is a church that is defined and shaped by our culture. Now, let us do a little bit, a little bit more work this evening with the text, with the biblical text. The text says here, when Jesus returned home to Capernaum, when he returned, well, from where? Jesus, having been confirmed by God at his baptism and his experience with the adversary in the wilderness, he went on a preaching tour, as it were with Simon and his brother and Andrew and James, the son of Zebedee and his brother. He called them to come and they came, went on a little preaching, preaching tour. And so these were fishermen who left their nets, who left their life's work and they followed Jesus. Then the text says, some people, some people, uh, in, in, in verse three, it says, um, some people, uh, Matthew, Mark 2 um, and verse 3 said, Some people, then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Hmm? Some people, now this is very important. I don't want us to, to lose this. Some people, no name, no identity, unknown. But some people, and these some people, they had a need. And that need was getting the paralyzed man to Jesus for healing. But they had an obstacle. They had an obstacle to discourage them, having that need met. And what did they do regarding the obstacle? The text says they went by the roof. <laughs> no, this is, a, this is a dangerous thing that they did because... The house, the house did not belong to them. It wasn't their house. They heard Jesus was over there and Jesus was healing and so on. And they had a need, somebody, you know, one of their um, you know, family member, friend, neighbor. Um, there is this paralyzed man, and they want this paralyzed man to be healed. And what they did, they mash up the roof. They rip up the roof of the house that they did not own and put the paralyzed man down before Jesus. Some people, no name. No identity, unknown. 
But they did the unconventional. They took the risk. Hmm? They took the risk. And they mash up a house that was not their own. Could you imagine when the owner of that house who possibly was there and so on heard, you know, brick and mortar begin to, to, um, to, you know, to be, to become, to come loose. And he looked and he saw a hole in his roof. I mean, I wonder if you could imagine um, how that person would have reacted. But the text says some people, uh, and they went by the roof, mash up and rip up a house that they did not own to put the paralyzed man before Jesus. I want us to spend a little moment here. I want us to spend a little moment here. This is missions. We're talking about missions. Don't you think that that is what the church needs? The church need the church need today. That the church in Saint Croix need that. Hmm? All the church in Saint Croix need is just some people. Just some people. Not many. Not plenty. Not few. But some. Some people who are unknown, but they have faith. Some people with determination. Some people with perseverance. And that is what we see here. The some people of the text, they had faith, they had determination, they had perseverance. And where you have some people with faith, where you have some people with determination, where you have some person with perseverance, they will remove any obstacle. They will take risk. They will overcome any challenge to bring others to Jesus. And that is what we want in the church today. We don't want plenty of people. We don't want many. We don't want, you know, we just want few. Hmm? We just want, sorry, we just want some. Some people. Some people of the kind and, and nature and understanding and faith and determination and perseverance as these people, uh, these some people in the text. You see, perhaps what we have in the church today are people who are known, well-known in St. Croix, in the Caribbean, at work, in their community, but they have little faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are known. They are known. But they cannot say like Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Hmm? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, what we, what we have in the church today are people who are known, but who are of little faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are known but they're not prepared to come out when rain falls. When rain falls, Bible study, lockdown. Bible study, nah, keep. But they're known. They're known. You know, what we have in the church today are persons who are known, but not prepared to come out at night. When sun done, they're home, they're not coming out. Dangerous. Dangerous. Gunman out there. Thief out there, desperate people out there, they're not coming out at night. Understandable, but it is the reality. Known, but not prepared to come out at night. Known, but not prepared to walk up the hill. The church too far. The church too far. I'm from a church. My home church is on a little hill. And you know the number of persons who refuse to come up the hill because the church far. Hmm? But they're known. They're not prepared to walk up the hill. Known. We're not prepared to walk with the Lord in the light of his word. But they're known. Very well known. I put it to you, fellow Methodists, that those persons in the church who may be unknown, but have faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are active in obedience to God. You check around, look around those in the church school and 
you know, those who are those who are visiting and 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 those in the those who may not hold office, you may not hold office. Um, you may not, you know, then the 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 those in the next um you know other circuits may not know them by their name. They may know them by their looks. They may know them by their address. Oh, that man, that woman that comes from the community there in Christian Hill, uh, the community there in Fredericksted. You know, not unknown, unknown. But they have faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are active in obedience to God. The text and the context then in which we live, in which we find ourselves today as a people and, 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 and the Methodist church calls us then to revisit the question that is being raised for our missionary endeavor in St. Cry um, this month, this season at this time. And, and, and the, the, the text that we have just read and the context in which we find ourselves is, it's asking us, demanding of us to revisit that question. What will it take to bring others to Jesus or to do missions by the roof? I want to address that question. What will it take to do missions by the roof? Unconventional means taking risk, not concerned about success, not concerned about fantastic results. But just to be faithful, just to just to take risk, just to be in obedience in responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we spend a moment to examine possibly some of our contextual realities of our Methodist church, of the church there in St. Croix, and I'm sure by extension, the Methodist church in the Caribbean and the Americas. We are not yet at the Caribbean and the Americas Methodist church, but and so we, you know, some, what are some of our, some of our realities? I see, I think we are trying to emerge as a church from what Reverend Watty calls, um, you know, a connectional, a connectionalism of dependence to a connectionalism of responsibility. From a connectional, connectionalism of dependence to a connectionalism of responsibility. And, you know, we having these difficult financial challenges that we're having, because what we have is still a connectionalism of dependence. We are talking about the weaker help the stronger and so on. You know, the weaker, weaker help the stronger. And so when we, when, when we look at how we allocate um, the percentages for um, for assessment and so on. And when, when we do that, that, my friend, is reflective of a connectionalism of dependence. What we want is a connectionalism of responsibility where each congregation, you know, each congregation, in, in light of the restructuring with its resources and development committee, with its mission and its evangelism committee, with its Christian education um, Committee, uh, it, it is the, the congregation taking responsibility for its response to the grace of God. Hmm? That that you're taking you're taking you know responsibility is not that that church in 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 in, in Frederickstead or that church in the community church is is depending on the church in Christian state, but that church in community, that church. You know, that church taking responsibility for its missions, taking responsibility for its missions. Not that they, they, they're depending on, 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 on some um, larger congregation with larger membership that has the ability to pay. No, we, we, it is now 55, 56 years of, of, of autonomy 
And as an autonomous church, each congregation must be able to take responsibility for the missions of God in which it is involved. Not to be depending on the congregation in the town, not to be depending in the congregation in, in, the, in the upscale suburbs. No, no, no. We, 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 we take responsibility. Yes, we know that a, a train is, strong, is, is, is as weak as its as strongest link. I know that we are interconnected. We know what that is. You know, we know we are each other's keeper. We know that. But having known that, we must take responsibility. And that is what the church is not taking, the congregations. You are not taking responsibility. And I want to put it to you that one of our realities, one of our realities as a church in the Caribbean and the Americas is that somehow, um, despite our restructuring um, in 1997, that is what that restructuring was about. That restructuring was about for us to emerge from that connectionally, from that connectionalism of dependence that was bequeathed to us by the Methodist Church. And because we are an autonomous church, we ought to be taking responsibility for ourselves. The day to day we take responsibility for ourselves. Right? The day to day we take responsibility for ourselves is the day, is the day that we, we end this dependence upon others, whether in Britain or in the town or in the suburbs. And I know what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. The church has appointed me at a place at the college where there are months I don't get stipend. We don't have it. We don't have it. The connection and office could not give what it is not getting because it was still a connectionalism of dependence. And my colleagues, Dr. Josiah and Dr. and Dr. Max Weedy, they suffer from it too. They suffer from it too. Yes, I the college looks after me at the moment. Uh, Carries looks after me, at the moment. but I know, I know, I have, I, I. This is something that I feel. This is something that I've experienced. This is something that I have suffered from. Uh, and, and we are struggling as a church to move from a connectionalism of dependence to a connectionalism of responsibility. I think we live, we live in a church, and we are part of a church in the Caribbean that is. His influence is that of a chaplain. His influence is that of a chaplain. You know what a chaplain does, you know, um, goes around and it attends to the, the pastoral and the psychological and the emotional needs of those in institutions that there's a crisis, he goes or she goes and he prays, he gives counsel, she gives counsel. Uh, they give guidance, they uplift, they, they uplift, they inspire. And gone are the days, it seems, in the Caribbean where, you know, the, the prophetic ministry, uh, the prophetic ministry, thus say the Lord, where what we do, what we say, our witness, is affecting structures and systems, corruption and, and violence and poverty in the society in which the church finds itself. There is not that kind of a, of a work that is, that is taking place that is affecting structures and systems and the, 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 the live realities um, of people, you know, we, we um, um, you'll forgive me if I use two Greek words, we talk about the doulos, a servant, and we're talking about the diaconos. Where are the, where are the deacons, the, the, the diaconai? That word is made up of two Greek words, dia and conos. And, and to be a deacon is to go through the doors, is to level with people huh? in their distress. It is to be in solidarity with their poverty, it is to be in solidarity with the injustices and so on. And you're not, we are not 
for me, I, I head a theological institution in the Caribbean. Have you ever heard my voice on anything, on any issue in the Caribbean? No, you have not heard, you have not heard my voice. Have you heard Dr. Edwards' voice on the national scene in St. Cry? Have you? Huh? And so we are part of a church whose influence is largely chaplain. We are, we are chaplain. I would invite you now, if, if I may, that, you know, when we look at the membership of our church, and I, I have taken up the yearbook that I get, I don't get minutes and so on again, I, well, except in the Jamaica district, but I take up the yearbook. And you do an analysis of the figures that are, that are in the connectional yearbook. Do an analysis of the figures that are in your district minutes. Do an ana an analysis of the figures that is presented at your, um, at your council meeting. Do an analysis of the figures that are presented at your congregational meeting. And I, and I assure you that there is an increase in the decrease of the membership. No, that is not a church that is growing. That is not a church that is lengthening. That is, um, that is, um, how I am, how do you put it? That is lengthening its stakes and strengthening its cards. That's not a church that is, that is lengthening its stakes. If you have a church where there's an increase in the decrease of the membership, talk to me about that church. Talk to me about that membership, membership, you know, the membership of that church and where that church is going and what is happening in that church. You look at our church and what we have are groups rather than a movement in the congregations. What is it that we stand for? What is it that we are resisting? But no, what, what we have in the church is groups, elites, and cliques. That is what we have. Huh? In, in, instead of, of, of we, we don't have a youth movement. We don't have a women's movement. We don't have the men's movement. What we have is the women's group. Women's group. Boundaries are defined. The men's group. And so who can join and who cannot join? And yes, we do say anybody can come, but it is uncomfortable because it is a group. A group. We don't want a group. We want movement. That is what we want. We want a church and the movement of this church. We, 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 we boast about it, that it was a movement. And we have institutionalize it so therefore what we have is what we have are monuments rather than a movement you know we talk about oh wesley did not want to wesley did not want to institutionalize the church wesley wanted wesley had a movement but we have proudly and gladly institutionalized it so what we have in the church are groups what we want we want movement yeah? we want a movement we want brigades. You see, like the boys' brigade, the boys' brigade, the advancement of Christ's kingdom among boys, and the promotion of habits of obedience. Huh? That is what we want. Brigades, possibly brigades, movements, not groups. And our chapels, our chapels are known more for what they were than for what they have become. I, I can explain this best by using Antigua, you know, Gilbert's Memorial, Baxter Memorial, Barrett Memorial. And we have on right throughout the, the MCCA. Every church want for every church want to be called Wesley. Wesley Memorial. Wesley Memorial. So it is more about the chapel than what the chapel represents, than the mission in which the chapel is involved the 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 the, 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 mem the church that you are the the chapel the 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 the, the chapel that holds your that, that that holds your membership is known more for the fact it is more it is known more for its name than for its mission you tell me what is the mission of the of the of, of the chapel or the church or the mission of the chapel that holds your membership but if you ask somebody, where is, where is Barrett Memorial? Where is, um, well, you don't have those in St. Croix. Where is Christian State Church? They can show you. But if you ask them what Christian Church, Christian State Church is about, can they? 
can they? I hope Dr. Edwards, I'm not speaking out of turn, but can they? And so I could go on and on, but I would share these realities with you. We are struggling to move from a connectionism of dependence to a connectionism of responsibility. The influence of the church to which we all belong is that of a chaplain. Um, there's an increase in the decrease of the membership. We have groups rather than movements in the church. And we, our chapels, the house of a membership, and we're coming back to that, um, they are known more for what they were than for what they have become. And so how then do we do missions by the roof? If at all that we go to do missions by the roof, um, brothers and sisters in St. Croix, my fellow Methodists, we have to be discontent with life as it is. We have to be discontent with life in the church as it is. You know, if you want to, you know, fold our arms and say it's all right, and you know, in, you know, in time, and it is the next generation, and so on. If there is no discontentment, nothing is going to happen. They're not going to take any risk. Listen, the some people in the text were not satisfied with the paralysis of the man. That, he, that, that they were not satisfied that he could not help himself. Their discontent drove them to take risks and to remove the obstacle. And so how discontented are you with the state of the work of God in your congregation, with the moral state of the society in which you live? It is your discontent that will cause you, that will cause us to act in obedience to God, that there is something better, that there is something more for the congregation in the society to act in that belief. After all, it is not about hoping for the best or hoping that everything will turn out all right. We are a people of faith, brothers and sisters. Rather, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. So if we are going to go by the roof, brothers, we are going, and sisters, we are going to have to be discontent with the state of the church and the state of life in the society. Secondly, if we are going to go by the roof, we have to more risk, you know, we have to more risk disapproval. If we're going to wait and consensus, nothing is going to happen. And so clearly in the text, going by the roof would not have met the approval of the owner of the house would not have met the approval of the superintendent minister, would not have met the, 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 the approval of Brother Joe, who has been in the church for all his life, would not have met the approval of, of, of Sister Jane, who has been in the church for all, the, all, all her life. He would not have met the approval of the owner of the house. While being an unconventional means of entering a house, a roof is not a door. It would have caused interruption, if not consternation, to the activity of Jesus and to all in the house, in the church, if we are to wait for approval to be active in obedience to God, nothing now happen. Nothing ever happen. If we are to wait for approval to be active in obedience to God, nothing now happen. And because nothing is happening to interrupt and cause consternation, because we are waiting for the committee to meet and the budget to be approved, hmm? you know, nothing is happening because the committee has to meet, the budget has to be approved. You know, the committee has to approve it and we must have the budget in order for, in order for anything to happen. You know the phrase, while we wait, while we fiddle our thumbs, Rome is burning. Rome is burning. While we, while we are waiting for the opportunities, while we are waiting, sorry, the opportunities are going and begging, passing us by, because time waits for no man or woman. Time waits for no one. And thirdly, if we're going to go by the roof, then it's going to cost, there's going to be a cost to you. There's going to be a cost to me. It's going to cost. Hmm? It's going to cost those guys that to climb up on the roof and remove brick and so on that were not their house. Risk, it was risky. Risky. But somebody, 
no doubt that some people of the text, the four men, had to pay to repay the man's house roof, we believe. And perhaps the paralysis in the church and society today remains because not a few of us are willing to pay the price to do what it takes to have needs met and to help others to help themselves to suffer for righteousness sake, to bring others to Jesus Christ, to bring others to Jesus Christ. Um, just perhaps there are too many would-be members in the congregations. You know, they, they, Luke 9, 57 to 62, call them would-be members. And, you know, the, the favorite among them is the man who says that he will follow Jesus, but <laughs> he must first go. He says he wants to first go and bury his father. I want to go home first to bury my father. Oh my, what do you mean to bury your father? You go home and you might die before your father. So how are you going to follow Jesus and you done dead? Hmm? Hmm? He wants to go back and bury his father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I know. And, and, and his father, yeah. father yeah. may yet, may yet outlive him. Mm -hmm. My father. Oh my. Can I ask you to mute your microphone? Hello, um, gosh, and and the father may may, may yet um may yet die before him. So he's going to follow the father. We, he's going to die before the father when he is dead. Hmm? Would be followers, you know. I will ask Saint Cry. Why is it in Saint Cry? When last have you had somebody? And this might be, you know, this might be a little stereotype and the traditional example. This might be our default position. When last has St. Croix has somebody candidating for the ministry? How many persons you have out of St. Croix circuit since its, um, since its establishment? How many persons can you say that you, know, you have sent forward in the ministry persons who have denied themselves and take up their cross and follow? No, I'm not saying, but that's why I'm saying it's a stereotype and it's a traditional example that being in the ministry is the only way in which you can take up your cross and follow Jesus. I'm, I, I'm, I know Sister Heiliger is there. I know Sister Heiliger. You know, there are others like Sister Heiliger, there are others who have taken up their cross and they are following Jesus. But as a, as a, as a probably something demonstrative, um, some sort of a, um, example on which we can draw as we are focusing on St. Cry, you know? When last, uh, have you ever, can you say that there's somebody out of St. Cry who have taken up the cross and come and follow Jesus? A Methodist minister, a missionary, serving the church, serving the people of God, not just in St. Cry, but beyond the boundaries of that circuit. There are some people of the text, I want you to hear me now, Methodist, this is, this is important. The some people of the text were not just change players, but they changed the play. You see, hear me. If you don't remember anything else I said tonight, remember this. What we keep doing in the church is to keep changing the players without changing the play. Man, if you, if you, if you don't change the players and you don't change the play, you have the same game. If we are going to be game changers, we have to change the play. Even if we're not, we have to change the play. So fellow Methodists, what we keep doing in the church is to keep changing the players without changing the play. We need to change the play, even if it is going to cost us. So how do we do missions by the roof? We don't have to risk disapproval. Uh, uh, we have to go on to be discontent with life at the state of the church and the society. We got to be discontentment. We don't have to take risk. And we don't have to be a cost. Uh, we are going to have to change the play. Now, I could stop there, but just permit me just to go on one little bit. One little bit, and then we, we um, we, we I, I will close my remarks. Um, 
what then, you know, we've answered the question, what is it to do missions by the roof? I want to locate the activity for missions. I want to, act, to locate the activity for missions by the roof in the congregations. And the way we do that, it is, I wonder if you know the history of your congregation. I said to the students here at UTC all the time, to my Methodist students and others, when you arrive in a circuit and you are assigned churches, the first thing you do is to go find the cornerstone. You know, Reverend Dr. Clifton and I said to us that we must always remember that there were those before you. You're not the first to get there. There are those with you and there are those who are going to come after you. And so we have to be conscious and aware of what was the journey about when it first began. Why was the community church formed? Why was Frederick State Church formed? Why was Christian church, church established? Do you know? What's the history? You see, opening of the chapel must not be confused with the beginning of the church. The opening of the chapel must not be confused with the beginning of the church, the church, the body of believers. It existed long before the building that hosts the gathering. There was some perspective, there was some need. And somebody decided to go by the roof. Somebody decided that what we need in this community, it is a place where a person can gather for worship. It is a person's where relationship can be solemnized. It is a place where babies can be baptized. It is a church where sinners can hear the call to repentance. It is, it, is the church, it is a place where God can forgive what you have been and direct what you shall become. Somebody, some people said that we need a church called Christian Stead, Frederick Stead. We need a church in this community. And so I am pleading with you, my fellow Methodists, not to confuse the opening of the chapel with the beginning of the church. And so what are the live realities that are influencing your work in that locality? Have you taken the time? Have you talking about is a response, missions. Um, the mission of God has a church. And if the mission of God is going to have a church, then those realities um, that are impacting the, the, the life of the church in that community. Those are what must shape the missions of the church. And so what is the history of the congregation? What is the purpose of the presence of this congregation in this community today? Now, that is the question. What is the purpose for the presence of this congregation in this community today? You answer that, and you have a different church in St. Croix. And then, of course, our boasted class system, and it is not the system is the issue, it's the meeting is the issue. The, the, the meeting is the issue. I put it to you this afternoon, that the most important person at the class meeting is the one that is absent. And don't tell me that that's not true, because I'm going to argue with you. I know it as a boy, growing up in the better as a Methodist church, I've seen it at work in Gingerland Methodist Church. I've seen it at work in, this, in, the, in the Wesley and St. John's Methodist congregations in St. Thomas. And I've seen it at work back in Antigua when I'm there. And I've seen it at work in, 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 um, in, in Jamaica. Don't tell me because we're going to have an argument, a big one, because I'm not going to accept it. The most important person at the class meeting is the one that is absent. And that is why we're not involved in missions. Because we don't care. Well, sorry, that's harsh. You know, we, we, we are not caring as much. The word that I've, that I've coined is careability. Careability. Our careability is lacking. Uh, our careability is lacking. And the way in which we can, we can, we can um, adjust that is that every time we meet on a Sunday, the 12 or the 13 or the 14 or the 10 or the six person that's supposed to be in that class. If that person is not there, we have to take cognizance of the fact that that person is not there and address it. So, so before we leave, there must be some strategy in place to go and visit that person, to find out what is happening to that person, to care for that person, 
And the day to day we begin to do that, we'll have a different Methodist congregation throughout the Methodist church in the Caribbean and the Americas. I guarantee you, I believe it. I have seen it. And, you know, we have to take note of celebrations. We're talking about caring for people, birthdays, weddings, condolences, anniversaries, promotion. I think I'm going on a little long, so I'm not going to think. But I want to locate missions in the congregations and indeed in the class meeting. And so, fellow Methodists, to go by the roof, to bring others to Jesus, is to be discontented with life as is, as is the, state of, the state of the life of the church, the congregation as is, is to risk disapproval. And it is being willing to suffer for Christ's sake. And so are you willing to go by the roof? It may be a mountain height, or over the stormy sea. It may not be at the battlefront, my Lord will have need of me. But if by a small voice he calls to parts that I do not know, I will answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, and I'll be what you want me to be. Amen. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Reverend Thomas. Ah, that was inspiring and indeed a call for action. So at this time, we're gonna, with your permission, we're gonna open the floor for questions from the platform. We only had one that came up in the chat. And if any hands come, I think I have some helpers, if any hands are raised. So the question, and I'm not sure if it was rhetorical or a question, but um, Brother Nelson asks, in this day and age, um, what do you think would happen if anyone break in someone's roof? So we know that they'll probably get sued, but I think that the question is probably relevant in terms of the ideology behind of it if we're gonna do something unconventional, if we're gonna be bold, what, what do you think is gonna be the response to that? Some of our congregation are still steeped in the old traditions. Do you think we're really ready to be that bold? Uh, you're directing it to me or to Mr. Nelson? To you, sir. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was questioning you about that. So I'm helping him with explaining it. It's on uh, you. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I'm not going to get out of that one. No, clearly, you're like, no, man. If you do that, you're in big trouble. You know your house. You can't go right. and do that. And that is why um, what they have done is so unconventional. And mm -hmm. that is why what they have done is so bold. Because it was, I don't know if they call, call out the owner and say to the owner, hey, look, we can get in through the door, you know, because there are too many people here. And this man is dying, he's desperate. We need to get him in there. So what we are going to do, we are going to remove some bricks off your roof. It was brick and mortar in those days. We're going to remove some brick and get him down because if we don't do that, he's going to die. I don't know if they got permission from the man, but I am just using this as a metaphor. That is what I'm using it as. I'm using it as a metaphor um, for, as you have said, um, um, Sister Horrell, for risk-taking and to be bold and to be non-traditional um, in our, um, in, in our missionary missions efforts today. I would like you to expand a little bit on uh, an area where you said that um, to win a battle, you can't win a battle without the war. Could you break that down just a little bit for me, please? Okay. Um, the battle, to win a battle and the war, uh, 
What I said was, um, to bring on us to Jesus, may yet demand or require going by the roof. Um, to want otherwise is to desire glory without a cross, wanting to reap without sowing, gain without pain, and winning war without fighting battles. <laughs> uh, if it is a war, how are you going to win if you don't fight, fight, um, if you don't fight battles? We are in a war to win, as let me just you know put it fundamentally, we are in a war to, to win persons um, to, um, to Jesus Christ. Um, and what is that going to take? It's going to take some sacrifices um, of whatever nature. And if we are not willing to, to, to you know, to, um, to pay those sacrifices, then we're not, going to, we're not going to win over anybody through Jesus Christ. It is as, probably it is as simple as what the text, the text says. Um, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Hmm? Deny himself. That is, you're going to lose, lose, you know, get get you loose from your moorings. That all those, all, you know, that will tie you to yourself, so that you are free. You know, make me a captive, you know, Lord, and then I shall be free, so that you can, you can, um, you can be involved in the work, um, in the work of, in the work of the Lord, so to speak, in missions. Thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. I do have two other hands up. So I do have Hugh S.H., that's first, and then Hailey, so I gather that it would be Sister Heilega. So whomever is Hugh S.H., can you unmute so that you could ask the question, please? Thank you very much. I am Horace Hes Hector. I'm a supernumerary minister of the Methodist Church in Caribbean and the Americas. Welcome, thank I you. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Edwards for his invitation this afternoon and uh, Reverend Dr. Thomas. Um, I always enjoy listening to him. I just wanted to comment on the matter of breaking through the roof. Um, it would seem to me that breaking through the roof in our present context is almost impossible. Um, most of the structures we are building in the Caribbean now are concrete right over. Um, some say it's for fear of hurricane um, because a concrete roof will not go. So it is virtually impossible to, to remove a roof. And yet, the context in which we are making our, our mission felt can be much more simple than that. Sharing what we have, as one of our hymns said, what we have felt and seen with confidence we tell. And I think in a way we have lost confidence, mm -hmm. confidence in ourselves, and, and some of us have lost confidence in others. So we would rather not encourage some persons to go on. Yeah. I, I want to use the term, we, we muzzle some persons from speaking. Um, and if you can't break down a roof, you can tell somebody about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And some of us, I believe, by our own action, we muzzle some persons from proclaiming the word. Uh, I wonder if Reverend Thomas could just reflect on that. <laughs> uh, Reverend Hector, good to see you and hear you. Um, yes, um, and then what I would want us to get carried away on is the fact that by the roof is a metaphor. Um, I'm using it. Um, to convey the whole idea of being bold. So yes, Horace, is going to be um, difficult to, um, you know, actually it was difficult then. It's not that it's difficult now, it was not difficult then. But the thing is, they did, they took risks, they went, they used an unconventional means because a roof is not a door. Huh? But they couldn't get through the door. So they went by the roof. 
and um and you know we are going to have obstacles how do we how do we address yes. and tackle them the the, the 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 obstacles that we find do we just turn back because they just didn't turn back now right they just didn't turn back they engage huh? they, they engage and they found a way in which to engage and maybe that is part of our problem we are not all right i like what Dwayne Dwayne is helping me out so thank you Dwayne Dwayne yes. is difficult <laughs> but it's not impossible and we look at it and we say that it is impossible and we turn we back and we're gone but they did not do that um, Horace. And, you know, if they muzzle you, do you just take the muzzle and say, all right, they muzzle me and you lie down? Or do you, do you, do you find a way to open up your mouth? If they can, if you can use your mouth, can you use your hand? Can you use your foot? Right. You know? Can you give them a look? Can you look at them? So if they muzzle, if them, if them, if them, you know, tie up your mouth, use your hand and use your foot, find some other means. You sign language, do something. It is difficult, but it's not impossible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Definitely not. Thank you for that as well. So we have um, Sister Heil again. I have two questions in the chat, one from Stephanie and one from Cheryl. So Sister Heil again. Thank you so much, Sister. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas. I always enjoy listening to you. Two thoughts. These persons were trying to get this person into a space or a place where Jesus was. They mm -hmm. were not just breaking the roof to break the roof. Jesus was there and they knew that that was the only person who could do for their friend what mm -hmm. needed to be done. Mm -hmm. So unconventionally, and, and to me, it would seem as though the house in which they were in, that person also had Jesus in that house. And I'm sure that they didn't have a problem. You know, all of them got together afterwards and fixed the roof. But that person, Jesus was there. And that was the whole thing. They knew that they had to get this person to Jesus by hook or by crook. And that is what you're saying, that we have to become unconventional thinkers, if we really believe that Jesus is the answer, that our people need Jesus, we are going to be looking for unconventional ways to get them there. So, um, you know, that is what I am um, 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 gleaming from, mm -hmm. what, from what you shared. My real, my, my real question, though, <laughs> so we... We come to this point of the year when we ask persons to bring in the envelopes and what have you, and you know, because it's mission, missionary time. And so everybody gathers the envelopes. Please speak to that in terms of that thinking. We are gathering missions money when we come to missionary time. Share a little bit on that, please. Um, in terms of what Sister Heilegger, um, in terms of his values. What no, 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 no. We, we only seem to focus on getting missionary um, funds in when we are coming to missionary meeting time. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't a year wrong focus. It's we're coming to missionary time. Let's get envelopes in and all of these things in. Um, speak to, what do you hear? What do you hear when you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I wonder, I know you're directly to me, but I have a number of colleagues here. Um, when Sam has jumped in there, I wonder if my other colleagues will want to respond to that as well. And one of my colleagues, ministerial colleagues, wants to um, respond to Sister Heiliger or to any questions so far. No, no, Mr. Colleague, but I could, I could want to ask, okay. is she sharing, are we focusing on the money as opposed to the people? We are looking at gathering money. Are we going to count the money? But are we asking, how many people have we brought? Mm -hmm. 
how many people have we been able to reach during mm -hmm. missions mm -hmm. or over the last year so that we can say how many there were, how many are we added to Christ? So I'm wondering if that's the direction looking at if we're focusing more on, uh, yeah, I get the envelopes and bringing the money, but we're not saying go reach out to people and bring them. I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, what, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's true, um, Brother Seal, um, because you're talking about counting the money. But um, I could add to that by saying, what really are the missions project um, that, you, that you have that when you have this concentration or this concentrated time, when you're asking people to, you know, to bring in the money for missions, what is it, what is it for? What is it contribute? What, what aspect of the, of, of, the, of the missions work of the, of the, um, of the, of, of the circuit or of the congregation is it contributing to? And I think Sister Heiliger, um, you know, from year to year, um, when we when we gather these funds, I think we should be able to say to people what the funds are for. You know, what 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 missions project, you know, uh, in the life and work of the church, the, you know, the missions of the church, that that you know, it, it, that that it is for, you know, its purpose. Now, I I know in one circuit where where um where I served, we had um what we call um, return of the talent that we gave persons, um, we gave persons ten dollars, five dollars at the start in September, and asked them to invest it and to return it, and it is going to go towards maybe we say um, the the insurance. We're not being able to pay insurance for the church uh, for the for the chapels. Um, we we you know we have not been able to adequately. Um, supply the um, the food bank um, that you know that we have, um, and so when the, when the monies were gathered, we were able to say exactly um, to what project the money was being contributed to. Um, so all along, we were raising this connectionally connectionalism or responsibility. I'm talking about all along, we have been raising the funds uh, for you know for for particular projects. So you're not you were not just giving money blindly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, th these monies were really, as it were, dedicated, dedicated funds. Okay, indeed. Thank you for that answer as well. Um, I'm just a little pressed because I think I have like seven more minutes, but I do have two questions that's been in the chat for a minute. So Stephanie did ask. Um, okay. Stephanie, you're there. And basically her question was talking yes. about changing the players, change the play. Is changing the play humanly possible? That's the question that Stephanie posed in the chat. Is changing yeah, the play humanly mm -hmm. possible? You know, um, yeah, it's, it is. Well, if you don't change the play, you're not changing, you know, you're not affecting the game. I and, and if at all that you're going to affect the game, you have to, you have to, um, you have to change the play. And the way in which you're going to change the play is that um, the players, the players themselves, um, you know, must know why we need to change the play. Why are we in the game? What is the game about? All right, um, you know, why are we serving? What is the what is the purpose for the for the um for the education committee? What is the purpose for the mission and evangelism committee? Um, and if we are not if we are not knowledgeable and aware of our purpose, then we're not going to we just going to carry on. We have the same players doing the same thing expecting different results is not going to happen right. and once we begin to be aware mm -hmm. of, of of our purpose of our calling we are going to change the play awesome. and changing the play we're going to change the game okay and like you say it's, it's a mindset thing yeah um and cheryl you're gonna ask your question cheryl you're gonna unmute well i will but um it just tied into what he said um, just a while ago. Okay. Um, how do we change the men if, if the if the mentality if, if individuals are stuck with that mentality? We've always done it like this, you know. How do we get them to swing, or how do we change their mindset? How do we um, get them to mm -hmm. accept something different? But he just said that you know once we are made aware of what. Oh 
the purposes, mm. Mm. you know, where we're heading, then probably we'll be able to, to do that. So I think um, that sort of took care of that answer. Thank you, though. Awesome. Thank you for that. And Reverend Laban is online. Um, Reverend Laban, you want to um, unmute? Well, you're unmuted and your hand yes. is raised. Okay. Yes. Uh, good, good evening, um, Dr. Thomas. Good to see you and hear from you again. Yes, I love that. Excellent uh, presentation as usual. The question I had, you said in one of your slides that uh, we have um, women's groups and men's groups and so <laughs> forth, but we don't have a movement. Yes. You would agree in the day of Wesley, there was a movement because of the social conditions at the time. Year after year, we see it in our circuit reports across the district, very little said about, um, you know, the, the, the state of the work of God, and especially as far as Christian social witness. So it seems to me we need some, some input there before we can have a movement. So there's a lot of talk and we know what the issues are as far as social issues and so forth and blight but very little as a movement. So can you comment on that or how we get a the movement as a church, not just only as a circuit, but as a, as a church across the board to, to have that social uh, movement? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Laban. Um, I would only ask you to think of, and those on, you know, think of the Boys Brigade. The Boys Brigade back in the, what, the 60s and early 70s when we were a part of it. It was, it was not a group. It was not for a particular set of boys of a particular age or, or so. It was for all boys. I remember, I mean, our churchyard used to be filled with boys, bugger activities. And guess what? And today, it still has influence. It was, it was about the advancement of Christ's kingdom among boys and the promotion of habits of, of obedience, discipline, self-respect, and all that tends towards a true Christian manliness. No, that is what we were a part of. That is what it was. It was. It was. That, that is what it was about. Huh? but I, 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 you know, you get the impression, and you know, sometimes, you know, I pastor congregations, and it is more about getting persons of a certain age together, and it, it is not about um, resisting some influences. It's not about advancing some some value. You get the feeling that it is I come out to play, as the Calypso say. You know, it is that we, you know, we come out to play. But no, if, if you get these boys and you're, you're very clear, as it was in the boys' brigade, that what we are trying to do here is to advance Christ's kingdom among boys, mm -hmm. all of them, all right? And what we are trying to promote are habits of obedience, discipline, self-respect. And so when we, were, when we had drill and we had to stand up for 20 minutes and 15 minutes, um, as you were, and right turn and all of that, those were contributing to that. But I don't, you know, um, maybe I'm a bit harsh um, to say, you know, in some of the, because I have been part of some very flourishing youth group. We come together, we have a jolly good time and so on, you know. Um, but we were not resisting anything. Yeah? We were not resisting anything. We were not standing against anything. It was not a movement for anything. It was in itself and for itself. You know, as I as I assess it now, and Mark, I'm, this is hindsight. You know, I'm looking back now, and I'm looking at it. But if we form groups, let's suppose the youth group is about um, is a drama group, and the 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 it is dramatizing um, life in the society, and they put it in the form of play. We did that, or it is a group that is going to dramatize the gospel lesson on a Sunday. You know, um, so so you can see that. That then becomes um, that then becomes a movement because what you what, what you're doing there that you're making the gospel relevant to today's live realities, huh? and, and 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 so when we come together on a Thursday night, when we come together as youth fellowship, that is what we are doing. We are thinking about the gospel and how we can interpret the gospel in light of today's realities, huh? rather than coming and thinking about when we're going to the movies or. Are we yeah. doing Bible search or something? Are we going to do Bible search? You know, I mean, as hard as I try to talk up, you know, to get the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I'm going to mess it up somewhere along the line. I'm going to miss out some Bible and some books and so on. I don't know. And you know, we have Bible knowledge and and um, we have know your church and all of that. Right. But then, what are we affecting? What are we resisting by that? Okay. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. It has definitely been thought-provoking and has really challenged us and opened our minds to different approaches to doing God's work with the goal of ultimate success. Um, the final, and we're basically out of time, but the last question um, summed it up, and it was, if our purpose is to follow 200 years ago or gather souls for Christ. And, you know, the person commented that we're stuck in our ways. And the, the whole context of what you said tonight really um, and incorporated that because yesterday we might have done it one way and it worked. We have to look at a new way to do it. So, yeah, we might talk about the brick and mortar and stuff like that, but it's really the concept. What worked yesterday may not have worked today. Look at what we're doing tonight. If we talked about this in 70 something, people would think we were crazy. But here we are in different countries on one platform, spreading the word, you know, so it's, it's a matter of just looking at innovation and seeing how it can get us to advance Christ and God's work here on earth. So we thank you so very much. As we conclude this awe-inspiring evening and end of the mission seminar, I invite Reverend Dr. Cuthbert Edwards, Superintendent St. Croix Circuit, to offer the, bene the benediction. Okay. Thank you very much. Just before the benediction, let me join Sister Faith in expressing thanks to all of you for coming and sharing these last two, hour, two hours with us. And thank you. Thank you also, Dr. Thomas. And shall we close? <clears throat> Let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, you have come near to us and shown us something of your patience, something of your love, something of who you are, and what you expect of us and all your children. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all that has been said today, for the questions that have been asked, the ideas that have been shared, and the blessings that have attended or gathering tonight. And now, O oh God, as we're about to bring this to a close, we commit to all who have been in attendance into your care, asking that you may watch over us tonight and continue to wrestle with us so that we may wrestle with the mission of our church as we seek to expand your work here on this earth. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant unto you his peace now and forevermore. And now go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Amen and amen. <laughs>